Hello, and welcome to another session of my string, oddly organized, perhaps hopefully somewhat organized set of videos about intelligence and learning. So this, where are we right now? I am in the moment where I have finished a whole set of tutorials about neural networks and some basic machine learning types of things that one might do with a neural network. <laughs> Not comprehensive, but a few demonstrations. I built a little neural network library in JavaScript and went through some matrix math stuff. So I'm ready finally at the time. I've been saying this all along that I'm making this neural network library and kind of looking at how things work and trying to make some creative examples. But later, eventually, someday, I will use a more robust, thoughtful, well-designed uh, framework as the guts, as the, as the foundation from which I will build all of my examples and projects, I'll use somebody else's machine learning code. And so today is the day that I'm going to start talking about doing that. And the foundation that I will be using uh, for almost all of these videos is a project called tensorflow.js. So let's discuss for a moment where, where, where did tensorflow.js come from? So you might have heard of something called tensorflow. Where to write this down? <laughs> TensorFlow. Now, first of all, you might even be asking yourself, huh, why is it even called TensorFlow? What is this thing called a tensor? Now, this is going to be really important because when I start to actually look at the code for TensorFlow.js, there's going to be stuff in there called tensors. And a tensor is actually a mathematical thing. It's a structure that holds numbers in it. And it's really basically, eh, maybe I should look at the Wikipedia page for Tensor probably, and it'll give you a good, I'll link to that in this video's description. But we've been, I've been referring to things as vectors. Well, we have scalars, which is like a single number, like three. We have this idea of vectors, which is a list of numbers, like three, one, four, et cetera. And we also have this idea of a matrix or matrices, if I'm being consistent about singular and plural, this idea of a matrix and a two-dimensional matrix might have a grid of numbers like three, four, one, five. So a tensor is a structure, a data structure essentially, that really can store any n-dimensional version of these types of things. Um, so this is the, and because the building blocks of any machine learning algorithm are matrices of numbers, <laughs> this idea of TensorFlow, flow, let's flow with the tensors. <laughs> Insert animation of me flowing down the river of tensors. Will that happen in post-production? I seriously doubt it. Um, uh, this is where the name TensorFlow comes from. So TensorFlow is Google's open source machine learning library. It is written, you might be surprised to hear this because you might think, ah, TensorFlow, it's Python, right? Well, yes, kind of. <laughs> I'm sure there are people who are watching this who know more about me. So uh, if you're watching the recorded version of this, check the video's description for all of the corrections. <laughs> but I'll go look for, I'll, I'll try to make any corrections at the end. But the TensorFlow is actually a library written in C++. It is a low level, C++ library with a lot of functionality for doing machine learning. Now, the reason why you might have thought to yourself, oh, isn't it Python? Well, there simply is a sort of bindings for Python, so to speak, a Python, a wrapper, so to speak, for Python. So Python being a programming language that's primarily used, uh, not primarily used, but is very popular in the world of data science, it makes sense if you're a data scientist and working with data and you want to do some stuff with machine learning that you would, and you're already in Python, you'd want to be able to access something like TensorFlow. So every, most all and every example that you would see working with TensorFlow is you're just kind of operating the low level TensorFlow stuff from Python. In fact, there are also uh, Java bindings for TensorFlow and probably other languages as well. And in another universe, if all this JavaScript stuff had never happened, oh, let's travel back in time and stop JavaScript from happening. Maybe what would our life be like? 
Should we try that? But I don't know if it's better or worse. I would probably be investigating, here right now, talking about the Java bindings for TensorFlow in an attempt to maybe go and use them with processing. And actually, this is something that I really, I know that uh, Gottfried Hader, who is the creator of the uh, um, Raspberry Pi ARM version of processing, has done some investigation of this, and this is actually something I really would like to do. But that aside, this project TensorFlow has been around for quite a while. Let me go look and find out how long it's been around, and then I'll come back. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm back. <laughs> I had to look that up. Uh, TensorFlow was open sourced in 2015. So TensorFlow actually is a project, according to Wikipedia, uh, started in 2011. It was a proprietary machine learning library used at Google for doing all sorts of stuff with neural networks and deep learning and more. Um, and then it was open sourced in 2015 under the Apache license. So here's the thing. Last year, I actually spent some time making some Python examples in TensorFlow, and I wanted them to talk to JavaScript. So what I actually did is I wrote something called a Flask server, which is a Python, Flask is kind of like Flask is to Python as Node is to JavaScript. I'm sure that's wrong in many ways. And then um, what I did is I had my P5 sketch talk to that Flask server, and the Flask server did Python stuff with TensorFlow, and then I could do machine learning tasks from within P5. And this is what I want to do. I want to be able to demonstrate and make examples and show things about how in a be beginner-friendly programming library like P5 or just in native vanilla JavaScript or if you're using 3JS or whatever JavaScript world you live in, I live in the P5 world most of the time, um, I want to be able to try to do some TensorFlow-y stuff. And so this was the way I was doing it last year in the Nature of Code, Intelligence and Learning course that I attempted to teach. Over the summer, I think it was last summer, a project appeared. A project appeared and it was called deeplearn.js. Now this is a, uh, my, my sense of this project is that this was a speculative project. The idea behind deeplearn.js is, aha, uh -huh, can we do this kind of stuff in JavaScript? And if so, how? So one of the things that's special about doing machine learning in today's modern era with TensorFlow is in addition to this whole landscape of all this stuff, where these operations that are written in C++ actually get executed, they, you have this question of do they get executed on the CPU or do they get executed on the GPU? And why should we care about this? Well, the CPU, the processing unit, the computer's processing unit, is that what the C stands for? Boy, I hope so. Um, is a little thing that chugs along and kind of does most of the work that your computer has to do. Sometime, sometime in days of yore, video games and special effects and graphics needed more and more processing and computing power. So graphics processing units were created. Graphics processing units were created and optimized to work with Pictures, images, pixels. What are images? They are matrices of pixels. Remember though, I was talking about how matrices are important to tensors and deep learning? All of the mathematical operations that happen in a neural network are matrix-based operations. Multiply these matrices together, add these matrices, sum these matrices, pass this activation function over this matrix, that sort of stuff. So the fact that over years and years and years that graphics processing units got optimized heavily to work with two-dimensional arrays of color information, pixels, it so happens that all this matrix stuff could be used with GPUs as well. So this is really, this is why we, deep, the, the term deep learning from my point of view is kind of in a way of like a rebranding <laughs> of neural net, machine learning with neural networks. But now we live in an age of big data sets and really powerful GPUs and a lot of this modern research is coming from the fact that these older algorithms that we didn't think could do as much can do more now in the context of where we live. Now, okay, why am I saying this? 
So how is this going to work? If we have a JavaScript implementation of TensorFlow, is the idea to just have another set of bindings? So you're really just controlling C++ from JavaScript? Well, that is certainly a possibility, and I believe that exists, or at least is in development. There is a node.js package for working with TensorFlow that actually connects directly to the C++ implementation and has a relationship to the TensorFlow.js stuff that I'm going to talk about here. But that's not what I'm talking about here. What the creators of DeepLearn.js, Nikhil and Daniel, uh, more information about them and the rest of the research teams that they work with in this video's description, I don't want to miscredit anybody important, um, they didn't actually write something to control native C++ GPU, they actually just rewrote all the C++ algorithms, loosely, I don't know about all, what's implemented so far not, in JavaScript. <laughs> and isn't that going to be really slow? Isn't that a terrible idea? Well, first of all, if you're me, I like things to run slow. Who cares? I just want the stuff to run. I want to play with it. I want to learn about it. I can always use something else to get it to run faster later. But maybe in JavaScript alone, it would run just way too slow. There happens to be something in the world of JavaScript called WebGL. WebGL is the browser's interface to OpenGL for doing operations on the graphics card, for drawing and making graphic stuff happen in the browser. So if the math operations of TensorFlow in C++ can run on the GPU, why can't the math operations inside of this thing called DeepLearn.js run via the GPU, via WebGL? And so that's really the magic in my mind of what was accomplished with this original project called DeepLearn.js. So let's go look at that website for DeepLearn.js for a second. On uh, March 30th, less than a month ago, um, DeepLearn.js became adopt this speculative project of doing these machine learning stuff in JavaScript was adopted by the larger TensorFlow project itself and, there, and, and has become this, ver this project called TensorFlow.js. So TensorFlow.js, this is now the project, oh, we can write that over here. By the way, if you can't see what's written up there, it's just some question marks. <laughs> Sorry about that. TensorFlow.js. So we're going to circle that. We're going to put some hearts on it and a few stars. Um, this is now the framework that I am planning to use in my uh, in the set of tutorials that you may or may not choose to watch, and that I may or may not choose to make. Because as of right now, I haven't made them yet. But that's my plan. All right, there's something else that's important as part of the picture here that I want to talk about. And to do so, I'm going to just erase this area over here. So, uh, okay. So, we have this terminology in programming, uh, high level versus low level. And I actually saw a discussion about this going on in the chat. There are low level programming languages. There are high level programming languages. One way to think about that is low level is actually you're manipulating the RAM and the data in the central processing unit. Like you just, you're all the way in there in the deepest part of the computer moving the numbers around yourself. Versus high level is something like really high level is like the scratch programming environment for kids where I'm like moving puzzle pieces and blocks around to try to create an algorithm. So that's one way of thinking about high level, low level. Um, so it's kind of, there could be this sort of a, a level of abstraction. So uh, TensorFlow, if I were to make, I guess I should put low on the bottom. TensorFlow, in terms of working with machine learning operations, TensorFlow is a low level library to do the actual matrix math and gradient descent, learning, training algorithms, all yourself, written into the code uh, yourself with TensorFlow. There's common operations that are implemented for you, but this is really a low level control of the algorithm itself. You can invent new machine learning models by writing them in TensorFlow yourself. Then, in between that, there previously was a, pro there still is, sorry, this project called Keras. Keras, 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 I don't know how to pronounce it. Keras, I always think everything is French for some reason. I don't know why. Um, so, um, and that's probably not even a French pronunciation of that word, but that aside, ooh, sorry, sorry that you had to watch that. Um, Keras was meant to be a higher level API built on top of TensorFlow. And in fact, uh, Keras was actually originally designed to be a higher level API that could sit on top of a variety of other low level machine learning frameworks. So for example, 
There's something called Fiano. Is that what it's called? I think it's called Fiano. There's like PyTorch, which is maybe, uh, well, PyTorch, there's Torch, and then there's PyTorch, there's Python's Torch. There's all these other machine, lower level machine learning frameworks that I clearly am not an expert on. But uh, Keras, the idea of Keras is you could kind of write your code, make a machine learning thing, and it could, it could operate on top of any of these. So uh, Keras, though, however, uh, more recently became part of the TensorFlow project itself. Um, um, and so Keras is actually, uh, and TensorFlow are linked together. So this is a higher level API that's written on, that's built on top of TensorFlow. And it exists as part of TensorFlow.js. And it's, so in TensorFlow.js, there's no actual concept of Keras specifically, but there is the core API and then what's called the layers API. And the layers API is something that I'm going to use much more in my video tutorials, although I'm going to start with a few that just look at the core stuff because it's kind of important to have a sense of what that is and how that works. But layers, so layers in TensorFlow.js is the equivalent of this thing called Keras. Now, a project that's being developed here at New York University with some collaborators from ITP and guests and researchers and students is a project called ML5. The five in ML5 is an homage, homage, that's French, right, to the five in P5, in the sense that, P, I mean, this is flawed for many reasons, but in, in uh, P5, you could think of as like a wrapper on top of Canvas and DOM to, to do like common creative coding functions to make drawing and making pictures and doing creative sketching projects a bit easier and friendlier in JavaScript. ML5 is yet another layer on top of, uh, well, sorry, I shouldn't put the, the it's, it's only for JavaScript, uh, as a layer on top of TensorFlow.js to do some common, to, to, to allow, to kind of like even abstract the concepts even a bit further. And, you know, I think one of the goals of ML5 is for it to be a library that a high school class could use, uh, a kind of weekend workshop for artists could use, these sort of contexts of people wanting to get a basic understanding and try some machine learning stuff out. Um, so anyway, so this is all the stuff, boy, this is a long introduction to all these pieces. This is all the stuff that I'm hoping to cover over the next several months. You can kind of pick and choose. Um, ultimately, you might be able, you'll, you'll see what's available for you at the time of watching this, but um, uh, ultimately, you might want to skip ahead and look at some of these ML5 tutorials because you don't necessarily, to do the ML5 examples, you don't necessarily need to have a knowledge of the core API of TensorFlow.js or the layers API even. Um, but I'm going to start, even though I might, my, the goal for the ML5 ex library and examples is to give people a starting place that you don't need to have gone through all the lower level stuff for my own kind of sanity in figuring this stuff out. Also, ML5 doesn't actually have a public release yet, whatever that means, but uh, the goal is sort of like have a quote unquote public release in June uh, with more documentation examples and features. Um, my, uh, I'm going to start, the very first thing I'm going to do in the next video is just look at the core API in uh, TensorFlow.js and see like what some of the things you can make do with it, what some of the functionality is and, and that kind of stuff. All right, how am I doing? I think this is good. I, I probably made a bunch of mistakes and missed a bunch of things. So uh, check the video's description because I'll, I'll write uh, corrections and stuff in there. And also uh, I will, in the next video, if you continue on whatever the, Google's YouTube machine learning algorithm tells you to watch next. <laughs> we'll hopefully have some anything that needs to be corrected. All right, thanks for watching this. I hope this was a helpful picture of my th of all these pieces and my thinking as it relates to them. Mm -hmm. Okay, goodbye.